Thank you. My name is uh, Douglas Paul. I'm from Carnegie Endowment, Washington, D.C. Uh, in recent months, in various forums, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer has said that from his experience, the WTO was never outfitted with the tools to manage a mercantilist approach to the economy that China now brings, and that China d does this in such a sweeping, uh, challenging scale that the U.S. should work to fundamentally readdress the principles on which the WTO is founded. I'd be interested in your reaction to that characterization. Well, I, I don't think the U.S. is going to leave the multilateral system because uh, uh, the system itself was created by the U.S seven decades ago, and uh, it worked in the U.S. national interest in the past. But uh, I understand that the U.S. or the current administration wants to uh, uh, improve it and uh, make it uh, uh, working uh, more efficiently and for their interest. But uh, it's up to our members to make decisions how they reform the system. and. Uh, as for China, I think it's important to, personally, I think it's important to uh, engage China and work China within the system instead of a confrontation outside of the uh, 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 global system. It's my uh, personal view. Minister. Well, um, regarding the multilateral trading system, the Deputy uh, Director General already mentioned the decision-making process at the WTO requires consensus, but it has been working quite all right until certain time period. Now, given the power shift uh, in the world economy, the two, you know, many, many different uh, emerging countries are confronting with the United States and EU. That means you never have any consensus on any difficult issues. That's the kind of thing we got stuck with. If you go to IMF and World Bank, there's a, a, a board system. They have a weighted, weighted voting so that they can have some kind of solution. But at the WTO, one country, one vote requires consensus. That means we must admit uh, it'll be awfully, awfully difficult to make any kind of sensitive decision. This is how we you know, prolonged for 16 years to conclude even a Doha round. I mean, we, we never had that kind of uh, occasion before on the GET system. So that's the problem we have to solve. Yes? Uh, only briefly. I think what we really have to get used to is that we, we live in a world of global governance, which is mainly shaped by the United States with some assistance of the European Union. Uh, and now we have new forces who claim that they also would like to shape global governance <laughs> to a certain degree. So if I think if we want to maintain global governance structures, we somehow have to react on that. We have then, as you said, engage in a di discussion how to change it, how to reform it. And we as Americans and European Union, I think, need a consensus how far we are willing to go uh, and where the limits are of the adjustments we are willing to make uh, with regard to mercantilistic um, efforts, with regard to the role of uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, with regard of government sub uh, subsidies. So, I, I still hope that there's some willingness on the Trump administration to have this dialogue between Washington and Brussels, because if we do it on our own, then we have end up in real trouble. And, and, and so I would really very much argue for, for finding a new consensus in this, how to deal with China. The lady in the front, yes, and then... Well, thank you, Asya Ibn Salhalawi, Ambassador at Large of His Majesty Mohammed VI. My question goes to Stefan Mayer. You have suggested as potential answers to the rise in protectionism to improve governance, both supranational government in Europe and, of course, the to uh, alien WTO address its woes. Uh, my question is uh, how you do that? at a moment where Europe is totally reluctant to any strengthening of its supranational, you have even said the word, you know, move, 
And second, do you think that the, uh, what we call the couple uh, Franco-Allemand uh, is strong enough to address this issue? And uh, second, what would be the uh, chances to get there, knowing you know, that the populists are basically against any kind of reinforcing you know, Europe? Uh, the other question is related, of course, to WTO, and which is much more recent than the historic international organization, but which is totally, are we condemned to paralysis? What you, as Deputy Director General, are proposing. So are we going to be prisoner you know, of this consensus impossible to reach forever? And as far as the reforms of the international organization, the uh, economic organizations, we do know it's been on the agenda for quite a long time. Everybody's aware of the discrepancy and anachronism between their functioning and the requirements of the changing and evolving. So what are the suggestions, except of saying that we are in a sort of quagmire and that we have to get uh, Trump's administration and the EU and the major uh, throw in. Of course, knowing that the voiceless, who is the third world and the, even the emerging countries, have no say in this respect. So what are potential uh, avenues to get out of this uh, uh, total you know, uh, blockade? Shall I really Excellent point. Yeah. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I might be more positive on the European Union than the majority of, of the people here in the, in the hall. I think that we have really a great, a great chance next year to restart it. So we saw the victory of a French president which clearly had an anti-populist agenda, uh, countering the main demands, and he won the elections. And of course, we have now in Germany a right-wing party in parliament, but still a very broad consensus about the major parties, about the pro-European uh, policy. And, uh, and as far as I see, we have the chance, beginning of next year, to revive the European Union, to restart the discussion on how we would like to shape it. And Brexit might help to a certain degree, because uh, many member states of the European Union are about to learn now what it means to leave the European Union and not to have it. But this won't be sufficient, as I said. It's, I think it's very important uh, to strengthen supranational efforts within the uh, European Union, but also to enforce the dialogue with other partners. Uh, and here we still leave it mainly to the member states uh, to do so, and we, we have also strengthened the European Union to do so. And not only, of course, to talk to our classical traditional partner, but also to look beyond and see who else might be a, in, have an interest in, in strengthening global governance and uh, who might have proposals we can agree to or we, we at least have to discuss. So I'm, I'm a little bit more positive than your uh, questions um, uh, tend to. Can I just add something? Um, th both of the questions have a kind of commonality of what do we do in a period of lack of leadership. Um, I think that given the problems the WTO has moving forward, uh, and the difficulties that the United States and China have in the economic relationship, I think there's a case for the US and China to basically take it outside the WTO and, and settle these issues bilaterally. Uh, for example, we have in the WTO right now the issue of China market economy status. Um, I personally think it's, over, it's overestimated because of the nature of protection in the United States. Whether you grant China MES or not is not going to have dramatic impact on market access, but it's an issue. I think you could see a situation where the United States and China just say, look, we're, we're major powers. We're going to settle this. And you could have, in the case of MES, for example, uh, you would grant MES in sectors where China looks like it's really marketized, and you wouldn't grant it in sectors where state-owned enterprises uh, have a dominant position. And you can kind of go through, and, and in return, you know, you would have the United States granting some constraints on the application of anti-dumping and, and, and countervailing duties. The real risk is if China pushes a case like this through the WTO, that the United States will not comply, and in the end, the Trump administration could simply pull the US out. I don't think that's likely. I want to be very clear, I'm not predicting this. But I would also simply observe that the United, under current law, the President of the United States could pull the US out of the WTO without any congressional oversight. So I think, uh, given the sort of dysfunction in the WTO, it is a very risky game 
for China to really press these cases with the United States. I think it would be better, frankly, given the condition of the WTO, to settle it amongst ourselves. Francis, you wanted to add something? So, um, in relation to the ambassador's last question, um, I think this is an extraordinarily important issue. It's a major, major issue. The whole multilateral system architecture is frozen. And uh, this is across all organizations. It's not just the WTO. Uh, and uh, cannot find the way to move forward. And I think that we really have to address this because at the same time, never have problems been uh, more global in nature and therefore more in need of multilateral solutions. So three suggestions, uh, small suggestions are, first, maybe we have to accept a multi-speed system. Okay, so that's a heresy in traditional terms. We've moved the whole international community forward over the past 60, 70 years together so that everyone is comfortable. Maybe we have to accept now that you can have a multi-speed system. Uh, and that means that uh, you would permit plurila plurilateralism within multilateralism. So if some groups of member states want to go forward to something, then I think that should be permitted, provided it doesn't unduly damage the interests of the others. Uh, now, that's again a major change and, uh, to the system. Uh, and then thirdly, I think that we are seeing a change in the nature of international cooperation. You know, for a uh, hundred years or more, uh, the instrument of cooperation was the treaty. Uh, and in today's networked world, platforms can be as important as treaties. And it's much easier to get a, a cooperation underway with a platform. Uh, those who want to join it, join it. Um, and uh, so I think we should perhaps think in these terms as well. What really paralyzes the system is trying to reach a multilateral treaty agreement. Sir. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Taz Sano, in a Jones Day to, of Tokyo. Well, so my question is, the, based on the, my previous experience as a negotiator is in the Uruguay round. I think the biggest success in the Uruguay round is the establishment of dispute settlement. Or any kind of the treaty or a contract or agreement, final enforcement should be done by the, some kind of dispute settlement mechanism itself. Now there's a two issues. One thing is it's about the dispute settlement issue of the WTO, and also this is one, one, another jeopardizing thing is the, as Mr. Mayor said, that ISDS agreement or the mechanism. These two should be this one of what is some kind of the final result to solve this certain kind of question. The protectionism itself is not just against the liberalization or something like that. Important thing is we need to have such kind of legal infrastructure. It seems to me right now that's according to, well, reading some kind of newspaper that the appellate body of dispute settlement mechanism is in WTO. It's really jeopardized by not having all the nominees in the WTO appellate body. I think you have the seven members or some, and already three is completely absent. And it's maybe next year that would be just only three in the, uh, this out of seven, the members of the appellate body, is if I'm, I'm, I'm correct. And that completely paralyzed the, uh, such a dispute settlement mechanism, is one thing. And about ISDS, the, in the TPP, we try to have the ISDS, but to my, to my knowledge, TPP 11, some of the countries is try to just delete the such an ISDS issue. And the same thing in NAFTA. Okay, it is, it's, it's the, one of the ISDS, 
Another one is arbitration mechanism of the anti-dumping anti and countervailing duty issue, which is both, this quite important, the chapter in NAFTA, but that is completely challenged. And so the many of the, what to say, uh, the now the FTAs or the, some of the bilateral, mm -hmm. the <clears throat> investment agreement and so on, the ISDS cannot be the really centerpiece of the treaty now. How do you think about that? Is this from the business side, from Maya, and is it from Mr. E? What's going on is on WTO in that kind of issue? Thank you very much. Thank you. Who, yes? Should, should I react on this? Uh, I think we made a decision in Europe right now to separate investment protection from trade policy. Uh, the, the future trade agreements we will have will be mainly on trade, and we will deal with investment protection separ separately. On the other hand, I think we have also a really major um, uh, issue of innovation, our CETA uh, treaty, our agreement with Canada, where we um, created a kind of international investment court dealing with ISDS. Uh, and uh, we learned that this is more acceptable to our critical pub public to have that, so not to leave it to merely private structures, but to have the states have a strong say in, in, in how to set up this court. And this is certainly an innovation we proposed uh, to um, the United States uh, uh, in the context of TTIP and which we will certainly also propose to Japan in our uh, free trade agreement with, uh, with Japan and all the others we will uh, negotiate. Uh, we, we think this is a major issue of innovation we have. Yes, you wanted to add one quick one? Yeah, I mean, about I, I, ISDS, it's not the same for all kind of ISDS because uh, Korea US FTA included ISDS, but we attach a lot of conditions. So uh, private companies cannot sue the government for certain areas, especially social policies like environment and labor policies. So attaching that kind of uh, uh, conditions, uh, ISDS could be a good uh, uh, foundation to protect the investors. But uh, if you just simply you know, include IS ISDS, maybe domestic uh, mm -hmm. constituencies are not uh, supporting that kind of uh, inclusion. Okay, you wanted to add one last word. Mr. Yi? Yes, very short. Uh, first of all, I, I, I would encourage our members to uh, resolve the crisis on everybody uh, uh, member issue. I think uh, it's uh, in all of their interest. And secondly, I think the multilateral dispute settlement mechanism is working much more efficiently than uh, RTAs because we checked all the uh, dispute settlement mechanism or provisions in RTAs were very rarely used. But uh, if you check WTO record, we, in, the, in the past uh, 21 years, we handled uh, more than 500 disputes very efficiently. Well, let me thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending, and thank you for your great questions. Thank you.